Hi, I'm Susan Birch and welcome to another A Health Detective podcast. And today I'm talking to A.V. Charlton, a GP from Melbourne. A.V. has a low-carb GP practice and today we're going to talk about how and why she got into low-carb, the kinds of benefits that she sees for her clients with this way of eating and how she may be able to help you on your journey. So, A.V., thanks very much for coming along today. Oh, hi, Susan. Thank you for having me. I know it's very early over there in Australia. <laughs> it's about six o'clock in the morning. <laughs> yeah, well done for getting up. Thank you. Would you start just by telling us a little bit about yourself, how you got into low carb? Um, I, I think you did it for personal reasons and then transitioning into a GP practice. Yeah, so I'm a GP. I've been a GP for uh, about 20 years. Um, I got into low carb after my children grown up a bit. They were little kids and after having babies, I wanted to lose some weight. So I had about an excess of four or five kilos that I want to lose after having babies. So that's about four or five years ago. Um, so I joined the gym and uh, worked out three times a week. After about three months, I didn't lose any weight. So then I started running as well. I participated in an eight-week body transformation challenge with the personal trainer, more as a, um, a bit of a fun thing to participate in a challenge. So uh, the eight-week body transformation challenge, the trainer prescribed me with certain macros of food. I had to put my food onto a, a, a food scale and measure my protein, measure my carbs and measure my fat. And uh, after about eight weeks, I lost four kilos and uh, about 4% of body fat. And that diet is basically a low carbohydrate, high protein diet with some healthy fat. So I, that's about all the weight that I wanted to lose. I lost four kilos and I was quite happy. After that, I looked into the science. I learned about eating less carb low carb and um, healthy fat. I read some books. I attended a, a course done by Low Carb Down Under for doctors. So it's a weekend course, low carb nutrition doctors course. And um, I got motivated and I was inspired to start my own low carb practice. There's all these other doctors that's doing wonderful things. So I started um, a, a weight loss program in my own GP clinic. And there's a few patients that went through, done low carb and uh, lose a few kilos. And um, I looked into the science more and more. <clears throat> I read books and lockdown happened. There was, uh, I had lots of driving to do. I read books on uh, a Fat Lot of Good by Peter Bruckner, Nina Teichel, and uh, Gary Taubes. So I become really obsessed in learning about why we've been taught to lower the fat, whereas lowering carbohydrates is really the key to good nutrition. So that's how I get into the journey of learning more and more and becoming a low carb GP. Um, then I started to prescribe more and more low carb diets to my patients. I reversed some uh, diabetes. I helped people with obesity to lose weight. And um, I connected with community and other people who are in the same journey and uh, other health professionals as well. And uh, here I am about a couple of months ago, I decided that I want to open my own low carb practice. So I've been doing, I've been prescribing low carb nutrition to patients anyway, but I wanted to have a clinic dedicated to promoting low carb nutrition. So about a couple of months ago, I planned to open a clinic and this clinic um, just booking patients in to talk about nutrition with longer consultations. So the people coming in can choose uh, uh, 45 minutes or 30 minutes thorough 
medical assessment, whereas the normal bot billing consultations, 10 minutes only, I don't think that's enough time to talk about all these nutrition things and uh, go through all the, um, the, the nutrition for a patient. Mm. So um, I've started a couple of weeks ago with the, the, my low-carb clinic. So that's been a wonderful journey so far. Yeah, well, well done on that. And also you do telemedicine as well, don't you? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So mm. I can do telemedicine, telehealth with a video conference for all around Australia. And um, uh, I can order medical tests. I can order, uh, I can email them tests that they can do interstate so yeah that helps all over Australia unfortunately not international at the moment internationally if someone came to you with some test results that they already had from their own GP would you then be able to um, coach them and help them with their um, you know, with their nutrition, would that be an, a way of doing it internationally? Yeah, um, I can, I just have to say that it is not a doctor patient relationship. I can assist them and uh, interpret it for them, but uh, just as a cover yep. myself with medical indemnity, it's not a doctor patient relationship. I won't be able to charge them, but I can have a look and give them some advice. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Great, excellent. So you talked about reversing type two diabetes. What other, and helping with obesity, what other sorts of conditions do you see low carb helping with? What kind yeah. of symptoms? Absolutely. There's a lot of conditions that it's related to the modern lifestyle with the, our high, high carb processed foods. Um, there's a lot of conditions that can be helped with low carb. So even mental health conditions, depression, anxiety, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome is another condition that I've helped. There's a, there's a lady who struggled with her weight and uh, after going to low carb, just losing not that much, a little bit of weight and struggling with fertility. After 10 years, she had a baby. Mm. So that was fantastic for her and me as well. Um, other very conditions, rewarding. Yeah. yeah, very, very rewarding with the baby at the end. Other conditions like gout can be improved with low carb nutrition. Um, irritable bowel syndrome certainly can be helped with going low carb and eating real food, getting rid of processed foods and sugars. Um, uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Lots and lots of inflammatory conditions, even aches and pains, arthritis, going low carb can help with all these um, inflammatory conditions. What's the biggest hurdle you see for people thinking about low carb? I, you know, I find that people tend to be, <clears throat> well, some come to it, you know, on purpose so that they'll know that you're a low carb doctor or they'll come and see me. Um, and so they come to it on purpose but then some people you know come along and then when you start talking about low carb they get a little bit frightened because I've heard lots of bad things and carbs are essential aren't they and where are we going to get our energy from and yeah. yes there's a lot of hurdles there's a lot of hurdles that people um, can't get their head around um, the culture is uh, makes it very difficult with such a high carb society. People don't know the carbs are bad for you. They think the bread and the pasta, and they think that's all essential. You think the breakfast um, cereals are really good for you. You've got to start saying a good plate of wheat bix <laughs> Absolutely, yes. They don't know breakfast cereal, wheat bix and oats are all high carbs and full of sugar. They, they can't get a head around it because they've grown up with it. The culture is, that's what they have to eat. Then struggling with um, going, going out uh, and uh, going to the supermarket, they think it's the easy way. And um, they think it's essential. They think they need it for exercise. They think it's filling for them. They think they, 
have to have all the carbohydrates, otherwise they won't be full. Um, then there's the traditional culture of eating low fat because eating fat makes them fat. And um, there's the medical community that uh, tells them that they can't eat so much fat because it's bad for the cholesterol, bad for the heart. So our medical profession doesn't make it easy either because sometimes they get results and then they go to the doctor and um, they get told off that they can't eat that way. Mm. I know you've lost weight, your blood pressure's come down, your triglycerides are better, you've reversed your type 2 diabetes, but gosh, your cholesterol's gone up a little bit. So don't eat like this because it's going to kill you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think the medical profession needs to learn more. I certainly practiced like that maybe about four or five years ago, but I have unlearned all the things that um, is not correct. Mm -hmm. And I have relearned the new paradigm that um, there's so much more new things that we need to learn now. Yeah. And I think that having GPs like you on board, you know, and, the, you know, there's such a great group of you in Australia and we're getting more and more New Zealand, um, that's going to really make a huge difference because people, once, once the medical profession start talking this way, people are going to start having a lot more trust. It's not just some fad diet out there that someone's come up with. Absolutely, yes, yeah. I think the medical profession needs to realise that the, the, the things that we've learned 20 years ago might not be right anymore. We have to keep up to date and uh, be open-minded that um, we have to learn new things. What would you say to someone who was worried about their cholesterol on low carb? Do you have any you know, thoughts about that? Um, I think they have to um, uh, learn that the cholesterol and the LDL isn't necessarily correlated with cardiovascular disease, whereas um, the, the more correlation with cardiovascular disease is the the markers of metabolic syndrome. So the markers of metabolic syndrome, there's no cholesterol and no LDL in the diagnosis and, um, and the correlation with metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is mainly, there's uh, five things to it. There's the uh, blood pressure, there's a uh, high triglyceride and low HDL, the good cholesterol. And, um, uh, high insulin and waste, high waist circumference. So all those things increases your risk of metabolic syndrome as well as the HbA1c, glucose numbers. So we need to take a, a, a thorough look at the patient all together and see if there's signs of metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, rather than just a, um, a cholesterol and LDL number. So we need to take the whole patient, whole person into context. Mm. Mm. Which is so important, I think. And I think, you know, for my whole, whole of my lifetime, cholesterol has been, you know, considered the number one cause of, of heart disease. So it is taking quite a while to reframe, reframe that and to get a better understanding. Absolutely, yes. What does the role of seed oils play in your mind? Do you talk about vegetable oils and the dangers of those along with the pro those processed foods? Yeah, absolutely, yes. I ask my patients what oil do they use and quite often they don't know the, the harms of seed oils. So quite often they don't know what seed oil is anyway. So I name them like vegetable oil, canola oil, sunflower oil rice bran oil. Um, they think vegetable oils are made from vegetables, whereas they don't actually know it's actually quite processed and it's highly um, inflammatory. They can be oxidized easily. So I particularly try tell them to try and avoid the, the seed oils and uh, margarine, um, 
so yeah, uh, and then they uh, they don't know that that they worry about takeaway. So I, I tell them that's what they use in the restaurants in takeaway fried food. That's why it's very important to cook as much as possible mm. and uh, avoid the vegetable oils, seed oils as much as possible because they can increase your risk of um, diabetes as well as inflammatory disorders, even cancer and uh, lots of other inflammatory diseases. Yeah. Yeah, and I think we're learning more and more about the harmful mm. effects of those. Yes. And they can accumulate in your um, fat cells over many years mm. and then contribute to that those inflammatory reactions and make it very difficult to lose weight as well. Absolutely, you know? yes. So Absolutely. they have a very different kind of metabolism. We're supposed to have omega-3 and omega-6, but only in tiny quantities, not in these massive quantities that we have with it, these processed foods yeah absolutely yes talking about testing we talked about that a little bit the other day how do you find you know do you find testing is important for your patients yeah I, I do yeah most of my patients really want tests and they want to know what their metabolic markers are I found it very helpful too. Um, I find the numbers, um, the cholesterol numbers, the triglyceride, the HDL numbers really tell a lot about how the body is going. And uh, the glucose, HbA1c, I also test um, inflammatory markers like CRP. So that tells us a lot about what the body is doing. I also like to test fasting insulin, which is a new thing that I've started to test in the last few years. Um, if, if there's time, uh, a two hour craft test to test the insulin number over a two hour period, like uh, the patient can get a fasting number, have a glucose drink, 75 gram of glucose drink and uh, a repeat number of insulin, one hour and two hours to test the insulin number over a two hour period, that's even more beneficial. Mm -hmm. But just the fasting insulin number would be very helpful to see how a patient is doing and uh, to see if there's any signs of insulin resistance. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I think testing is fantastic. And most of my patients that come in would like someone with testing. And I like to do a baseline testing and probably repeat it again three months and six months and 12 months and get a bit of an idea on how the patient is going. Mm. The patient also likes to see their progress. They see their triglyceride number coming down. As I explained to them, the triglyceride um, shows them if they're eating too much carbohydrates or not too much. Quite often seeing those numbers Getting the heading in the right direction is a good, good um, uh, uh, idea for patients to track their progress. And it's quite motivational too, I think. Absolutely, yes. And you know, I see with my clients that it stimulates them to take action once they, you know, if they see that the markers are very high and... <clears throat> then they want to know how how can I reverse those and how can I get those down yes yeah absolutely yes <laughs> in New Zealand and you know when we spoke the other day we talked about this a little bit in New Zealand it's very difficult to get blood tests through the GPs and they'll do some of the basic markers but they get very discouraged by the minister ministry of health to carry out testing and I like to do a few um, nutritional markers as well alongside the metabolic markers so you know first of all we've got the issue that the GPs don't necessarily understand the relationship of those markers but then they're also very worried about getting into trouble yeah. you you explained that to me a little bit the other day would are you happy to talk about that yeah, yeah, it's the same in Australia. So the GP 
the usual GP usually isn't um, aware of all the testing of nutritional markers. And quite often it is discouraged by the Medicare process to do a thorough testing because the GPs can be audited. And if we order too many blood tests, then um, Medicare can tell you off and tell you that you are ordering too many blood tests, spending too much money, the taxpayers' money. So recently, about uh, two months ago, there was a, a audit by Medicare of GPs, about 5,000 GPs who order too many blood tests, especially the iron studies, vitamin D and thyroid functions. These GPs who order too many of those blood tests are sent a letter to receive a warning that they have ordered too many of those blood tests and they are suggested they are to do an education activity to learn how to order blood tests properly. And um, so I was one of those GPs and um, it's, uh, it's, it's shocking how these GPs are targeted because quite often the female GPs are targeted because we see more of the tired patients. Some, a lot of these patients are pregnant and um, we want to find out why they're tired and it's a good screening test for the pregnant patients as well. And we get told off. That's why there's a lot of hurdles for these GPs to order a thorough blood test for nutritional markers. And uh, we worry that we get into trouble. Mm. Mm. And it's interesting too, because as a female GP, I presume you've probably got more of a female patient list. I'm not sure about that. Absolutely, yes. We but got, then, yeah. you know, with thyroid, Hashimoto's is exploding and you know and that's something that can respond well to low carb and especially getting that gluten gluten out of the diet and that, that wheat out of the diet so you will be ordering more tests just to see where people are that's, at and yeah. follow and then following up on their progress as well absolutely yes I want to follow them up yeah patients appreciate those tests I put about I put a post up about this um, Medicare auditing process up on social media and I get so much support by the general public that GPs should be doing preventative medicine and ordering tests and finding out what is happening to their patients rather than um, worrying about this auditing process. Yeah, and you know, the way I look at it is with the work that you're doing, if you can get someone off their diabetes drugs and get them off their cholesterol medication and you know their depression medication that is saving far more money for the taxpayer than you're spending doing some testing trying to get to the root cause of what's going on for them absolutely yeah I think so I'm um, making them take less medications they're reducing the insulin they're reducing their diabetes medication blood pressure tablets they're coming in to see me less which is not good for my business but it's good, good for Medi medicare and taxpayers money i'm improving their health and um that's even better than treating and, their conditions yeah and even the qual the quality of their life and also their ability to live up to their potential in their life you know, because if people are really focused on poor health and taking care of their poor health, they don't have a lot of energy to put into living, you know, a wonderful, magnificent life and being a really great contributor to society. So I think, you know, there are all those other subjective intangibles. Absolutely. Yeah. Diabetes oh. costs the community so much money. Yeah. It's not just the cost of the medication then they progress into complications, they get into hospital with um, kidney disease, um, nerve diseases, heart attacks, and uh, eye diseases. There's so much complications that um, they go into. If we can reduce those complications by giving them proper food, I think that's so important, but um, we don't talk about it enough. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I've also heard that and GPs I've spoken to have told me they've only had, you know, six or 10 hours of nutrition training over the course of their, you know, training to become a doctor. And I also think <clears throat> what I see quite a lot, because I know that you do all the biochemistry training because I I follow a parallel path in terms of nutritional biochemistry. So I know you know all the biochemistry. It's just that it's never been related back to the food that you eat and the nutrients in that in that food. And I think it's done early on too. So you get through your exams and then you're learning about going into practice and kind of dealing with acute things as well. Absolutely, yes. We're not taught enough about nutrition. We're always taught to refer to the dietitians, and um, the GP should have a more of a responsibility in telling the patients what's good nutrition and what's not. We need to know about more of the medical conditions that are related to our poor nutrition. And um, it's only the last three or four years that I've learned so much about nutrition that's uh, changed my practice. Mm. And changing the lives of your patients as well. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes in to see you, do you have a process they go through? You do some testing, you look at their diet. Do you have different ways of introducing them to low carb? Yeah, yeah, so absolutely. So depends on where the patient is at. So I have to meet them where they're at. I offer all the options to them. I provide them with information. It really depends on how they want to go about it. So I, I offer it to them. They can go slowly. They can have a plan. They can have, or they can go cold turkey. So some patients aren't ready to change. Maybe they need to slowly get rid of um, some foods, maybe they just have to stop their sugars and bread first and slowly progress to reducing all the other foods. And so I provide them with all the information first. But some people are ready to go cold turkey. They are ready to give up all the carbs. They I can um, go to real food straight away, meat and veggies only. But um, these people have to be supported that they might feel a bit unwell for the first week or so. They might need to add some more salt to the food. They might get a bit of crude keto flu. They might need to adjust the exercise and be more gentle on the body. So it really depends on where they're at. That's, yeah, that's great. <coughs> oh, excuse me. How often do you see things like keto flu? Because that's something that people, you know, puts them off and they'll, they'll stop doing what they're doing. Do you have a, you know, if someone's suffering quite badly, do you sort of take them back a step and have a more gentle process so that they can transition more, more easily? Um, sometimes I see it, but quite often it's not that bad. I, I, I usually warn them anyway when they start. Yeah. So it gives them a bit of an idea that they will feel a bit bad for the first week. So sometimes just warning them gives them a, an idea. Um, quite often they get a bit tired, they get some cramps, and uh, some of them exercise a bit and they feel more lethargic that, that they can't do their usual exercise but um, I warn them that uh, they can if they get so, some more salt in their diet or they can drink some electrolytes sugar-free electrolytes that they can manage a bit better and if they manage if they be more gentle on their body and um, exercise more gently they can manage a bit better so Usually most people manage okay, mm. especially if I warn them beforehand, yeah. And there's, there's just that process of switching over to being able to burn fat for energy, you know, when you've been a carb burner for a long time and, you know, you start having those cravings for carbs. So, yeah, it can take a little while to switch over. Yeah, absolutely, yes.
Do you have limits, you know, do you have guidelines on carbohydrate intake? Do you have any upper limits that you like to use? Again, it really depends on the patient. So it's, um, I give them the information, the lower they go, the, the better outcome they can get and they can lose the weight faster. And if they get into ketosis, if they do less than 20 or 30 gram of carbs a day, then they can get into ketosis and they can get into uh, more faster weight loss and um, they can get more benefits. But quite often the patients can't go that low and they want to do it more gently for more sustainable and they don't want to go that low in the beginning. They want to be more gentle on themselves and that is fine. Even cutting down to less than 100 gram or even less than 50 gram. So that doesn't, they don't go into nutritional ketosis. They go low carb rather than keto. They still have the benefits. They might not lose the weight as fast, but they still can get the benefits of low carb if they eat real food, a little bit of berries, a little bit of root vegetables. They can they can have the benefits. So it, it, they don't have to go into ketosis. Mm. And what about working with families? Because, you know, one of the challenges I find in my practice is people might be keen but then they've got to live in the real world with their colleagues at work feeding children they've got you know partners and so it can become quite that can become quite a challenge and often you know often particularly the woman will say to me oh friends and family just roll their eyes and go here we go another diet and they don't feel very supported. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, their friends and family quite often don't understand and um, uh, then they're not supportive that uh, when they go out for dinner that uh, they don't eat the cakes and the treats and uh, sometimes their family members bake a cake and they want the person to enjoy the cake and they don't understand that um, they shouldn't really have all these treats as well. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes the mums, they cook for the children and their husband. They don't want to cook two meals. They don't understand that there's ways to go around it by cooking one meal. So I put on my social media how I manage it. So I've got two kids. There's, they are 10 and 13 and I don't think they need to go very low carb and my husband doesn't really need to they don't, he doesn't want to anyway he doesn't go low carb so I put on my social media how I manage it so I cook the meat and everyone eats the meat the kids and my husband do eat some root vegetables they are real food so potatoes and sweet potatoes they do eat a little bit more of those and um, but I try and have a minimal amount of those root vegetables. I eat all the meat and I eat low carb vegetables. So that's how I manage my family. And then um, patients need to understand that the the treats and the uh, the chocolate and the cakes are really not beneficial to them. So they can either get rid of it from the pantry or um, they, they can um, stay away from it. The, the kids and the husband can have a little bit of it and try not to have too much of those treats and mm. uh, sugar as well. Try and bring treats back to being what it means, a treat, which means something that you have occasionally not, it's not, you know, part of every meal. I mean, sometimes I think we want to treat ourselves every time we eat, you know, we want it to be. Yeah. We want it to be special. And Absolutely. Yeah. So I think it's just a little bit of a shift in mindset there. Yeah. Breakfast and lunch are often problems for people. They feel they can deal with their evening meal, you know, some meat and some veggies and maybe some root veggies. But breakfast and lunch is a problem. What, what are your suggestions there? 
Yeah, yeah. Quite often people don't know the cereal and the oats are not good for you and they send your sugars roller coaster and give some give you a sugar high and not really lasting um, satiety. So I give them idea that um, a high protein breakfast is much better for you than the cereal and the oats. So I myself eat three eggs for breakfast almost every day. I, I, I don't think it takes very long time. I can make an omelette with three eggs in 10 minutes and eat it within 10 minutes. So I rush out the door to drop off kids and go to work anyway. So I'm very busy, but I can manage to cook a breakfast within 20 and eat it within 20 minutes with three eggs and sometimes a little bit of veggies and mushroom or sometimes cheese. Um, there are ways around it. You can make a, a chia seed pudding. You can make it over in the fridge and bake it overnight. And um, you can prepare it beforehand and you can eat it before you rush out the door. You can do some boiled eggs and that's quite easy and portable. You can take it out the door or you can skip your breakfast and have a bit of intermittent fasting. You can delay your meal, your breakfast, and have a bit of a brunch at like 9 or 10 or even 11. Then have a good protein brunch instead of breakfast and lunch. Then that might get you, if you're rushing out the door, then that might be a good option to not eat your breakfast and have a good brunch with uh, lots of eggs and maybe a tin of tin fish that might be uh, portable and you can have it easily at work. So I, I like to give them those ideas that they, they can have good, easy lunch and uh, breakfast. A lot of my lunches are leftover meals from my dinner. Mm -hmm. So my dinner is meat and veggies. So I cook a little bit more meat and cook a little bit of, bit more veggies and, um, it's the same as my dinner, heat it up in the microwave at work. And um, that's a good, easy option. They don't have to go out. They don't, the sandwich isn't easy, isn't as easy as a leftover dinner. Mm. So I think there's lots of ways to go around it. Mm. And what do you say to people who say they still feel hungry after they've eaten that? Yeah, so if you're hungry after a meal, that means your meal isn't enough protein. So we need to prioritize our protein intake for each meal. So if you're hungry, you need to think back on the meal that you've eaten. So quite often if I eat two eggs for breakfast, um, it doesn't last me until lunchtime. If I eat three eggs, then I more I feel more full and I can last until lunch and I'm not looking for food at uh, 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, so sometimes some of my friends need more than three eggs. Sometimes they, I have friends that do workouts a lot or they're men. They might eat five or six eggs for breakfast. It, it sounds a lot, but it's actually fine. If they feel like their body tells them they need that much protein, then, then it's, it's good for them. <laughs> People worry that they eat too many eggs or too much protein, and, but it's an individual thing. So, um, yeah, I think we, I think we have a real misunderstanding about protein. You know, it's absolutely vital, and particularly as we get older, and it works out on sort of grams of protein per kilogram of of body weight or lean body weight if you need to lose some weight, and I think that's very important to follow at each meal because if we don't get enough protein we start breaking down our muscle mass to release those amino acids into our bloodstream because protein is the building block of everything in our body you know not just our muscles but you know our bones our blood our hormones our enzymes so yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everything depends on it. And we don't want to be breaking down our muscle to supply protein for our body to run because then 
but then we get fatter, you know, that um, body composition changes and we've got a higher fat ratio to a lower lean body mass ratio. And quite yeah. often, quite often, I think that's, you know, for people who have only got a few kilos to lose, quite often, I think that's the problem is the loss of muscle. And so then it feels like you've got so much more body fat than you actually have. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. Most people don't appreciate the proteins where the nutrients are, especially people that are getting older. They feel like, oh, they can't eat that much meat and they don't want to eat that much meat. Or some people are animal conscious. They think it's environmental friendly to not eat so much meat. But um, we need to think about species specific nutrition that the human actually need or this protein. So we should be prioritizing protein every single meal. Again, as you said, if you don't eat all the protein, you lose protein, you need, you lose the bones, you lose the muscle, especially with those with sedentary lifestyle, not strength training, not doing exercise, then the fat will build up and um, losing bone strength and muscle strength. And uh, that's the, the older you get, the, 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 those people are at risk of falling and then they can break the bones and they can lose the strength. And then that's where the problem of deteriorating health is. Yeah, really well said. And the other thing I think about muscle, you know, when you're talking about the exercise there is that... <coughs> excuse me, the more muscle we have, the better we can dispose of any surplus glucose that we that we consume. So, you know, our muscle is, is kind of like a glucose sink and the glucose goes into the muscle and it can only be used by the muscle once it's in there. It can't come back out into the bloodstream. So if we can keep having good levels of muscle, and then do that exercise and burn that glucose off. That's a huge benefit um, to add to the low carb, that low-carb lifestyle. Absolutely, yes. I think the, the more muscle we have, then the insulin can work better. We become um, more insulin sensitive and less risk of um, metabolic syndrome and uh, can improve your diabetes and control as well. So... People don't realize a little bit of muscle training, um, do some squats, do some lifting. That uh, it doesn't have to be hard. That uh, will really improve uh, insulin sensitivities and improve health as well. So absolutely. And you know, if you're just starting, you know, just body weight exercises, push-ups off the wall, and like you say, some squats to a chair. Yes. And Absolutely. then if you're, you know, if you're more advanced, well, then you can work out harder or get a personal trainer like you did and, and you know, join a gym and start getting some properly planned programs that are designed for you. Yeah, yeah, great, yes. Yeah. Uh, where can people find you? Um, yeah, so I'm very active on social media. Um, my handle is uh, Dr. Charlton Low Carb GP. That's on Facebook and Instagram. I'm also on LinkedIn as uh, Avi Charlton. Um, I've also got uh, uh, my clinic name is Melbourne Low Carb Clinic. That's on Facebook and Instagram as well. And I have a YouTube channel, just collecting the videos that I've made with um, previous uh, like uh, low carb Lifestyle Long Weekend Summit with Tracy McBeath and some talks I have done and future talks, I'll put my talks into right. my YouTube channel. So my YouTube channel is just my name, A.B. Charlton. Right. And um, if people are interested in seeing me as a patient, they are most welcome to. In Melbourne, I'm in Wonturner. The clinic name is Melbourne Low Carb Clinic. Uh, they can book me to see him as a patient uh, Australian-wide, they can book me as telehealth, and uh, so we can do uh, a video conference as a telehealth medicine. So there's lots of ways people can find me, or you can just drop me a message or an email. It's on my um, 
social media and website. Great. And I'll make sure I put all those links to you in the show notes so that people can can find you and track you down and have a look at your work and encourage anybody who's looking for a low-carb doctor to, to get in touch. I know I've got some clients in Australia who I wanted, you know, I needed to find a low-carb doctor for them. And it's very difficult because all the doctors are booked up and they all just go, oh, I'm sorry, I, you know, I just don't have room for anyone else. So, um, so it would be great if they keep you in mind. Thank you. I'm also listed on a few different low carb websites like Low Carb Down Under. There's my name on it. Um, Tracy McBee's Low Carb Lifestyle Hub is a fantastic resource and I'm listed there too. Diet Doctor, I'm listed as a Diet Doctor Pro. So patients can sign up with me with, and get uh, uh, access to Diet Doctor as well. I'm also listed on Nutrition Network as a practitioner. So patients can go to Nutrition Network. network. They, there is lots of education material for patients as well as practitioners. And I've done lots of Nutrition Network courses. So I'm listed there as well. So I've, I've got my name in a lot of and you're, and you're just completing a course now too, aren't you, to get some more accreditation? Yeah, yeah. So I want to list myself as a, um, a metabolic health practitioner. So the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners, I at the end of the month, I should be able to list myself as a practitioner accredited with SMHP, the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioner, then um, I'm listed there as a health practitioner as well. That's great. That's absolutely fantastic. Is there any final things you'd like to say before we wrap it up? I know you have to go. I think you've got to get the child to a bus stop or something in <laughs> five minutes. Yeah, yeah. So we have to leave the house at seven o'clock in the morning to, to get my 13-year-old to a bus stop. Yeah. Um, the final words is, yeah, so just drop me a message. If you're keen to be my patient, that's fantastic. If you just want a view advice, I'm very happy to give you some advice on how to start. And uh, you can look at my work, you can listen to my talks. And um, if you're in Melbourne, you can come to my clinic and you can borrow some books. I've got a low carb library. And um, you're most welcome to contact me. Fantastic. Hey, thanks so much for taking the time. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. And I wish you the best of luck with your new clinic. I really hope it flies for you. Thank you, Susan. Thanks for having me. It's such a pleasure to, to be on your podcast. Thank you.